Okay, here we go. Uh, understanding your religion, the seven major doctrines that define the Christian religion. We're on lesson number 10. The title of this lesson is God's method of reconciliation, which is atonement. Now before we get into the material, I, I want to do a little quiz just to see how much uh, we remember. I'm going to ask you some questions. And uh, on your worksheets, you, uh, you have some lines there where you can write the answers down. We're going to do it real quick and then I'll give you the answers back and then we'll move into our, to our lesson. All right, question number one. Name the three major doctrines in the Bible that we have studied so far. All right, three major doctrines that we have studied so far. Three major doctrines we've studied so far. All right, number two. Answer yes or no to each of these statements. First statement. God knew in advance that those in Christ would be saved. Yes or no? God knew in advance that those in Christ would be saved. Yes or no? Next question. God chose in advance some for eternal life and some for destruction. Yes or no? God chose some in advance for eternal life and some for destruction. Yes or no? Next question. Original sin refers to the first sin ever committed. Yes or no? Original sin refers to the first sin ever committed. Yes or no? Um, next question. Uh, man controls his destiny. Yes or no? Man controls his destiny. Yes or no? And then one other question. Name any three sub-doctrines mentioned in connection with the major doctrines of these lessons. So any three sub-doctrines that we've talked about in relationship with the major doctrines that we have mentioned. Three of them, if you can remember, okay? Now, I'm not giving you a lot of time to do this. Like I said, it's just a pop quiz, get the juices flowing, you know. Um, all right, so let's, let's give the answers real quick. Number one, name the three major doctrines in the Bible that we've studied so far. So, inspiration, the inspiration of the Bible. Secondly, the divinity of Christ, right? And uh, the um, a doctrine of original goodness, there's three. You can also mention the fall of man or the doctrine of reconciliation. So any, any three of those five um, will be okay. Uh, next one, answer yes or no to each of the statements. Uh, God knew in advance that those in Christ would be saved. The answer is yes, God knew in advance which ones would be saved. Why? Because He knows in advance the result of things. Next question, God chose in advance some for eternal life and some for destruction? No, no, God did not choose arbitrarily some people to be saved, others would not. That's Calvinism, uh, that's uh, that particular uh, interpretation of the doctrine of predestination. So the answer is no. God did not choose in advance, some for destruction, some for salvation. Uh, original sin refers to the first sin ever committed. The answer is no, almost a trick question, right? Original sin refers to a theory, if you wish, or an interpretation, uh, a theological position uh, that was originally put forward by uh, Augustine and developed by Protestant uh, reformers. Uh, next question, man controls his own destiny, yes or no? The answer is yes, man does control his destiny. God offers salvation, man can refuse or accept, he still has the ability to choose. Even though his nature is, is weakened because of sin, uh, he still has the ability to understand the gospel, to believe the gospel, still has the ability to say yes to God or no to God. And then name any three sub-doctrines mentioned in connection with the major doctrines of these lessons. We haven't studied all of them, but you know, the, you know, I said there are 10 sub-doctrines, so any three, election, predestination, atonement, redemption, re, uh, regeneration, adoption, justification, perfection, sanctification, and salvation. Those are the 10 sub-doctrines that we'll be going through. Okay, so you total up your own score, see how you did. Just a little quiz to, uh, as I say, get the, the brain moving, get us in gear. All right, so let's uh, kind of review the five 
major doctrines that we have talked about so far. First one, inspiration of the Bible, the entire Bible inspired by God. Second major doctrine, the divinity of Christ. Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God. Jesus is God, that, that, that major doctrine, very important. Third major doctrine is the doctrine of original goodness. In other words, God created man good. God created man with the ability to obey. God created man with the ability to manage the creation and so on and so forth. That's the doctrine of original goodness. The fourth doctrine is the doctrine of the fall of man. Man fell because of his disobedience to God. God uh, put forward um, you know, a dividing line, things that he could do and things that he couldn't do. And the thing he couldn't do was to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Man crossed that line, man disobeyed that command and thus fell and all the consequences that came with that. So that's the doctrine of the fall of man. And then the fifth doctrine, the one that we're really talking about in this lesson and the next one, is the doctrine of reconciliation. God, because He is a God of love, uh, uh, desires to reconcile, to bring man back into fellowship with Himself. And the 10 sub-doctrines that we talk about, the 10 sub-doctrines explain how God has you know, accomplished this work of reconciliation. All right, so the biblical doctrine of reconciliation says that God is restoring man to himself through Jesus Christ. Then last time we talked about the first two sub-doctrines that explain this process of reconciliation. So the, um, the first one uh, is the doctrine of election. And the doctrine, or that sub-doctrine of election, explains how God chose Jesus Christ as the instrument through whom He would offer salvation to all men. All right? So the entire history of the Jews, when you're reading the Old Testament, you're reading the entire history of the Jews and the purpose of that history is to establish an historical stage upon which Jesus would eventually make His appearance among men. So the doctrine of election says that God made a choice. He chose Jesus Christ to be the one that would accomplish the task of, of bringing man back into a relationship with himself. And then the next doctrine was the doctrine of predestination. Remember I said election and predestination, they have been misinterpreted, but they are biblical doctrines. Okay? They're not Calvinistic doctrines. They're, 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 they're biblical doctrines that have been misapplied, I believe. So the doctrine of predestination describes the fact that because of His internal nature, God knew in advance that those who would be united to Jesus Christ by faith, and that faith expressed in repentance and baptism and faithfulness, would be reconciled to Him. Okay? So easy to understand this idea of predestination. God knows in advance the result of the work that He does. He knew in advance all the people who would believe in Jesus, all the people who would put their faith in Him and obey the gospel, God knew in advance that those people would ultimately be saved. And we said in our last lesson that the doctrine of predestination is like a guarantee. God guarantees if you do this, this is what is going to happen. And we know that this is a sure thing because God cannot lie. And when God guarantees something, we know that it's going to happen. So, in other words, when we put these two doctrines together, you know, uh, election and predestination, we could say that God always knew that those in Christ would be saved. All right? Now I also mentioned that the value of our movement, you know, the restoration movement, the churches of Christ, the value of our movement is that this is where the, uh, the, these biblical doctrines were rediscovered re-examined and re-taught to the masses. So you're wondering, well, you know, what's, what's the churches of Christ, what's that all about? Well, historically, we began rethinking these things and representing to the world the idea that all men have the opportunity to be saved, not just some, and all men could respond uh, to the gospel and be sure of their salvation. All right, so in today's lesson, we're going to study the third sub-doctrine, 
uh, which is the doctrine of atonement. And the doctrine of atonement is the method that God used to reconcile man to himself. Jesus was the person that he used, atonement was the method that he used. Okay, so let's talk about atonement. Atonement, the word atonement, English word, comes from a Greek word which means to reconcile or to cause a change or an exchange. In other words, a change on the part of one party induced by the action on the part of another party. Okay? Now in the Bible, the doctrine of atonement refers to the death of Jesus Christ as the means by which God and man became reconciled or were brought back together or restored to a state of friendly relationship. So God changes His attitude towards man because of what Jesus Christ has done. So God chose Jesus to accomplish the atonement. And here's how the atonement works. First of all, there's a problem. And of course, the problem is sinfulness, man's original fall and man's continual sinfulness. For example, in Isaiah 59, verses one and two, Isaiah says, behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, your sins, have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So the problem with mankind is sinfulness. Sinfulness, disobedience, produces estrangement between God and man. And I'll give you an example how estrangement works. Let's take a, a typical married couple and let's say one of the partners cheats, okay? Someone commits adultery, has an affair, and so on and so forth, and it's a secret for a time, but eventually it comes out, okay? The, the, the wife or the husband, whoever the innocent person is, finds out about this, and they talk about it, and they, you know, they're trying to work it out. You ever notice in those type of relationships, boy, a, a wall seems to begin to build up there, right? I mean, uh, one person is saying, well, how could you have done this? And the other person you know, is saying, well, you, know, you didn't treat me right. And all of a sudden, what was uh, an open relationship, easy to share, intimacy, all of a sudden now there's a wall that, that brings up. It's difficult to talk to each other in a civil manner. There perhaps is no intimacy now. There's a wall. And what has created that wall? Well, violation of the marriage covenant or sin, right? Adultery has caused that, okay? Well, in the same way, man has betrayed God through sin. And what kind of sin? Well, it's, you know, the extent of the sin, it's universal. In Romans 3.23, Paul says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's not just that some men sin, all, beginning with Adam, all men have sinned after that, a complete betrayal. And in Romans 5 verses 12 and 13, Paul says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. Why? Because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So this, the extent of sin, the extent of the betrayal, is universal. There's a wall between God and all men, all mankind, because of sin. Now, what is, the, what is the result of all of this? Well, the result, excuse me, I forgot to read a passage here. It says, nevertheless, Paul continues in Romans, he says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So what is the result of this universal sin? Well, the result, as I mentioned, is estrangement. Estrangement between man and nature. The environment has been disrupted. Estrangement between man and God. Man feels guilt. Man feels fear. God is brought to, is moved to the point where he has to execute judgment and condemnation. Um, uh, there's death separation of the soul from the body. In Romans 6, 23, it says, for the wage of, wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus 
our Lord. So there's not only separation of the soul from the body, which is physical death, but there's also separation of the soul from God, which is spiritual death, all because of, all because of sin. The problem is sin, the extent, it's universal, the result is complete estrangement from God. So what is the solution? Well, the solution is that God will reconcile man to himself. You know, he's, he's, he's going to remove that wall there and bring man back into uh, 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 fellowship with himself. Just, I go back to my husband and wife analogy. You know, at some point, one of the partners is going to say, you know, what I did was absolutely wrong. And I ask your forgiveness because I've, I've sinned or I've, I've, you know, I've, I've broken our vows together. And it was my fault, I was selfish, and so on and so forth. And then they begin to talk. And then the, the, the guilty one says, you know what, I, I'm willing to go to counseling because I love you and I, and I want our marriage to work and I'll do whatever it takes you know, to save this. And the other person says, well, you know, you're not completely guilty either, you know, me too, maybe there are things I can do. And so, you know what I'm saying? If people begin to be reconciled slowly but surely, they're bringing that wall of estrangement down so that they can once again speak with one another and be happy together and have intimacy together. Well, in the same way, the solution uh, uh, between the estrangement between God and man is to bring that wall down, okay? Uh, in Romans 5 and 6, Paul writes, for while we were still helpless, separated from God, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, okay? So there needs to be a reconciliation with God. That, that's what's required in order to avoid spiritual death and permit some reconciliation between all other elements of the creations. Because if we're reconciled with God, then it's easier for us to be reconciled with each other, with, with the creation, and so on and so forth. The death on the cross by Jesus that Paul is talking about is the action that brings about the change in God's relationship with sinful man. In other words, what God uh, uh, did changed what God felt or how God viewed us sinners. So the key question here is this, why not just forgive or destroy everybody? You know, I mean, God has the power to do, but why not just say, you know, I did, you, you are wrong and you people are sinners, but you know what, I'm just going to forgive you. Or the opposite, you know what, I'm tired of you, I'm just going to destroy you all. Because God is sovereign. I mean, who's going to question them? Who's going to be around to question them if he decides to, you know, eliminate the entire human race. The answer here is that the problem with either of these solutions is found in God's character. He is perfect and He's also perfectly balanced. For example, His perfect sense of uh, 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 an execution of justice requires that His laws be obeyed and the natural consequences of disobeying His laws be allowed to happen. So God is, on one hand, is perfectly just. The laws that He have made, they have to be obeyed. And the consequences of breaking those laws, well, those consequences have to be met. So a core law revealed in the Garden of Eden said that disobedience leads to separation from Him, which is death. Let me read that in Genesis 2, 16, 17. It says, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely, surely, he said, die. So that's a core law. And if God simply changed the law or suspended its consequences, it would not be perfect as far as justice is concerned. He makes a law, he can't just you know, change the law or skip the law and be perfectly just. It is right and just and perfect that those who disobey God be punished and consequently that those who obey God's law be rewarded. This is perfect justice. Even in human laws, it's perfect justice, right? So the fact that no one obeys perfectly is not a reason to change the law 
or to suspend its consequences. That's not the way he's going to work out the reconciliation. He's not just going to throw the law out in order to reconcile us to himself. Why? Because he's perfect and his law is perfect and he was not going to violate his own law. All right. Another part of God's character is his perfect love. Remember that balance I showed you? you know, perfect justice on one side, perfect love on the other side. It was God's love that moved God not only to create the world, but also it's the perfect love that God has uh, that motivates Him to save the world, right? In John chapter 3, verse 16, we read, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. So there's God's perfect love. The problem here can be stated in the following way. How can God express His perfect love in reconciling sinful man to Himself without violating His perfect sense of justice which demands satisfaction for breaking the law of God? Now, how do you balance these two things? A further complication is that even with the knowledge of his disobedience and willingness to be re reconciled to God, you know, even if a person sees, look, I'm a sinner and I you know, don't deserve, but I, I, I want to be reconciled to God. Even if we realize this, man is unable to make up for his disobedience and remove his own guilt and the condemnation that comes with it. That's why Paul says, while we were helpless, Helpless in the sense that even if I know that I'm a sinner and worthy to be condemned, and even if I want to do what's right and be perfect and so on and so forth, I can't do it. I can't accomplish it. I, 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 I can't bring myself to do that. All the willingness in the world doesn't get me there. So God cannot violate the terms of His own justice and let man go free. So what is needed is a solution that will satisfy at the same time both justice and mercy. And so the doctrine of atonement is the teaching that explains how God resolved this dilemma. Okay? So now, remember we said the problem was sin, the extent, universal, the result, estrangement from God, the solution to be reconciled to God, the method that God used to solve this problem is referred to as atonement. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. It says, and He, here He's referring to Jesus, He says, and He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. So in this short verse, Peter summarizes the doctrine of atonement. Jesus offers himself up as a sinless sacrifice to pay the moral debt of all men. Okay? That's the idea of the atonement. I'll repeat again. Jesus offers Himself up as a sinless sacrifice to pay the moral debt of all men. So let's break it down. Let's read Romans 6 here, verse 23 again. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus' sacrifice satisfies God's perfect justice because the payment for all sin is made. And so the law that requires a price to be paid for disobedience has been satisfied once and for all time. Disobedience causes death and a death has now been offered to pay the moral price. All right, let's read uh, 1 John 4, right? Here John is saying, by this the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so God's perfect love is also satisfied 
in that He offers His own Son as sacrifice in order to rescue us from condemnation and death. Justice is satisfied, you know, a death is offered, a perfect life is offered to pay for the sins of man. Love is satisfied, God's love for us, instead of us having to pay that price, He sends His own Son to pay that price. That's His expression of love. So in the cross of Christ, we see the perfect balance of God's justice and God's mercy working harmoniously in order to bring about reconciliation. Remember, that's what it's about. The death of Jesus on the cross, this is the action which satisfies God's justice and the debt we owe for sin. It is also the thing done that changes God's attitude from one of condemnation to one of forgiveness towards sinners. Because of what Jesus has done, God changes His attitude towards us. Before, His attitude was, I will judge you and then I will condemn you based on my judgment. Now, because of what Jesus has done, God changes His attitude towards us from one of judgment and condemnation to one of reconciliation. Sinner, you may now come home. You know, uh, faithful son of God, you can come uh, to the Father. So unless the debt or the justice is satisfied, there can be no forgiveness. And Jesus pays that debt. He makes the atonement. All right, now, a lot of people think that they are you know, fairly good or moral or decent people, and, and consequently, they don't feel the need to be reconciled to God. They think they're okay. I never killed anybody. I, you know, I served in the military. I served my country. I risked my life. I've raised children, I've never committed adultery you know, against my wife or husband, I give to the poor, you know, they think they're, they're pretty good. But we need to realize that no matter how good or moral we are, we could never atone for our own sins with our own lives, even if that life has many good and sincere deeds. You see, God's justice requires a sinless life to be offered, not just a pretty good life. All right? And the reason for this goes back all the way to Adam. Adam was created and he was sinless when he was created. And then through sin that he committed, he forfeited that sinless life. Okay, so he had a perfect sinless life and through disobedience he forfeited, he lost it. Okay? Everyone born after Adam is less than Adam was because the sin that began with him has now spread to, to us, and because of sin, death. So a sinless life needs to be offered up for the life that Adam forfeited. This is only just, you know, one sinless life is offered for one sinless life that was lost. A perfect life offered up to replace the perfect life that was lost. So let's read a little uh, passage here in Romans. Paul says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, there you go, losing the perfect life, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin, it's just what I, I've just told you. Watch in verse 18. He says, so then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, that's Jesus dying on the cross, there resulted justification of life to all men. So no one, therefore, could live a perfect life and have such a life to offer as atonement, no matter how nice and moral they were. You know, if I wanted to offer my life, let's say I lived a pretty good life and I wanted to offer my life in exchange for the life of my wife, for example. I love her. She's the love of my life, I don't want her to say, I'll say to God, take my life in exchange for her. And you know what, even if I manage to live a perfect life, let's just say somehow I managed to live a perfect life and I was willing to offer it for her, I could only offer one life in exchange for one life. I'll tell you why. Even if you wanted to offer your life, it would not be good enough to satisfy God's demand of a perfect life. But let's say I could offer a perfect life. Let's just say that, all right? This is why Jesus had to come in order to 
to do something that I couldn't do. Jesus had to come in order to first live a human life without sin and then offer that perfect life to God through death as a payment for the life that Adam forfeited through sin. His perfect life for Adam's perfect life. Now, in addition to the perfection of his life, Jesus was also divine in nature. So the value of his life was without measure. In other words, it had such great purchasing power. You know, you have a, a pound of copper and you have a pound of gold. They're both metal, right? They're both heavy, right? Which one has more purchasing power? The gold, right? So the perfect nature of Jesus' life made His sacrifice acceptable. And the divine nature of His life made His sacrifice valuable to the extent that it atoned not only for Adam's sin, but for every sin committed for all time by all men. That's what I was trying to explain to you before. I got a little ahead of myself. Let me, let me double back and explain that. So imagine if I somehow could live a perfect life. Well, if I could live a perfect life, I would be able to offer my perfect life, one life, for the life of my wife, one life, one for one, okay? But my perfect life would not be valuable enough to exchange for Lee's, my wife, and my four children, and their four spouses, and, and our grandchildren. You see what I'm saying? Because my perfect life is still just a human life. Even if it was perfect, it could only be exchanged for one other human life. But the fact that Jesus' life not only was perfect, but that His nature was divine, okay? His, his essence, his in, the intrinsic value of His life was so far beyond the value of a human life. Why? Because He had a divine nature. So because of his divine nature, his sacrifice is valuable to the extent that it is able to be exchanged for all the lives that ever existed. All the sinners, all their sins, all their lives are exchanged for the perfect and divine sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. So there have been a lot of people you know, who have lived good lives and have even sacrificed their lives to save the lives of others. But let's remember that as far as the atonement is concerned, only Jesus has both a perfect and divine life to offer God in exchange for the souls of all men. All right, we're going to stop here. I want you to hang on to your notes there because we're going to continue. This is a two part, too much material to actually you know, cram into just one, uh, one lesson. So we're going to continue with part two of the atonement in our, next, in our next lesson and move on to see the results uh, of the atonement and then we'll also tackle some of the other sub-doctrines in this uh, particular section. Okay, well, so thank you for your attention. We'll see you next time.